Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Hello and welcome to this week's Painting of the Week. And it's a special this week. I'm at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam at the Vermeer exhibition which is the biggest exhibition of Vermeer's works ever. They've managed to bring together 28 of his estimated 37 works. So that's about, what, 75% of the entire of, of Johannes Vermeer. The exhibition's on until June 2023, so if you're listening to this before then, I strongly urge you try and get to see the exhibition. Otherwise, of course, you'll be able to see it in one of our exhibition on-screen films. Now, I'm very lucky. I'm with the author, Tracy Chevalier, who's going to talk with me about a particular favourite of hers in the exhibition. Famously, she's the authoress of uh, Girl with a Pearl Earring and appeared in a previous film of ours, exhibition on-screen Girl with a Pearl Earring film. And, of course, she's written many more books, and I urge you to read them all. And we're standing in front of a painting that she's chosen to talk about, which is Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window, dated 1657 to 1658. It's normally in Dresden, but right now it's here in the exhibition. And Tracy, why have you chosen this painting of the 28 to talk about? Well, I think everyone expected me, probably you expected me to choose Girl with a Pearl Earring, but I've talked about her so much that I thought I would choose my second favorite (laughs) Vermeer painting, which is this gorgeous painting made several years before Girl with a Pearl Earring. And um, I have always, uh, I had in my life a goal, life goal to see all of the Vermeers in the flesh. And um, this painting, Girl Reading a Letter, was the last one I saw. Ah, So I have a special fondness for it because of that. But I also love it because um, there are so many quintessential Vermeer tropes in it. Um, And yet there are also some things that are very different about it too. So we have a girl turned in profile, uh, looking down, she's in, in a window light. The light is coming through from the left as it often does with Vermeer. And she's holding in her hand uh, a letter that's brightly lit um, in white. And it's kind of curved over, and she's reading it very intently. And the window is open, and one of the wonderful things about this painting is that her reflection is in the window. So you can Mm. see this reflection of her looking down, and the reflection also looks like Mm. it's looking at the real letter. Very clever. I love its theatricality because on the right th- uh, quarter of the painting, from top to bottom, is a green curtain that has been sort of theatrically pulled back. And the light hits it, so it's sort of a yellowy green. And I love that theatricality. There's also a red curtain coming down on the left from the window, draped over the open window. and. There's a certain um, stage setting Mm. of this that is both artificial and yet somehow extremely natural. I think it helps that the, particularly the, well, both of them, but particularly the green curtain, the folds in it are so realistic. You you just think, that's got to be velvet. I just want to reach out and touch it and smooth out some of the some of the wrinkles. There's also a fantastic fringe at the bottom of the curtain that's been, he's dotted it in little bits of light paint. Uh, it's, it's almost impressionistic and, and yet it looks so real. Um, there's also a table between us and the girl. The table has this sort of ruched Turkish carpet and then there's a bowl of apples and pears, peaches maybe, tumbling down. and. It has the effect of um, setting her apart from us. She really doesn't know we're there. She's intent on that letter. What's going on in that letter? Is it a love letter? What could it be? Um, But we are privileged. The curtain's been drawn back and we're able to see her. Now, now we don't know enough about Vermeer to know whether he was a regular theatre-goer 
But often these, some of these, some of the paintings feel very theatric to the extent of having the curtain. It's almost like the curtain's just opened and this is the opening scene. Yeah. I mean, how much of this is an expression of this is what I can do as an artist, I am really a master? And how much of this is, if we look carefully and we start to analyse the clues, are all those things part of the storytelling? That, that bowl of fruit, which is slightly on, on the, you know, the, the almost tumbling out, yeah. is, that, is it showing off or is it actually something Or does to it mean reflect? the love is a little bit tumultuous yeah. and maybe falling apart? I, you know, I hate to go too heavily into that sort of symbolism. And one of the things I love about Vermeer, as opposed to some other Dutch artists, is that he doesn't go for the symbolism too heavily. Um, and uh, sometimes a bowl of fruit is just a bowl of fruit for, with him. Um, and I think particularly in his later paintings. But what's really interesting about this painting um, is until recently, the back wall behind her was a blank white wall. Mm. And they did some analysis of the painting and discovered that it had been painted, something had been painted over by someone else later. Now, who would touch a Vermeer painting? I don't know, but mm. they did. And so they cleaned it and they took off that and they uncovered this huge painting of Cupid with a bow, which has been, um, you see that in other paintings, uh, Vermeer backgrounds. And the idea is that it, if you, um, you know, Dutch painting like this, it means Cupid is there. That means the letter she's reading is going to be a love letter. And I don't know, um, I actually kind of preferred it with the blank wall because I think that it, you don't need that. I, I actually like the ambiguity of not knowing what kind of letter it is. Is it a love letter? Is it a letter of loss? Is it, what is it? Is it a boring family letter? Who knows? Um, so it, it uh, I was a little disappointed to hear when I, that this painting had been uncovered, the Cupid painting. But now that I'm seeing it, I'm sort of getting used to it. I think it's an earlier painting of his, so maybe he felt he had to be more symbolic. So maybe you're right that that bowl of fruit tumbling does mean something. I mean, it's... it's I can almost understand somebody owning this painting thinking, that is ridiculously huge, that background painting. <laughs> it's really I mean, it's big. really oversized. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Cupid is bigger... Well, it's, it's almost as tall as her. Yep. Yeah. I, d I doubt that it would have been anything to do with, I mean, they wouldn't have had an issue with, with a you know, naked Cupid, but no. maybe they just thought it's distracting from her. Yeah, although having said that, the, um, I really like the way the painting cuts across the back of her head. I think it does it beautifully, so you know, the upper half of her head is, has the painting, the dark painting behind it, and the lower half of her head has the white back and, and, I, and I like that effect but I'm not sure about Cupid himself mm. I think they could have made it he could have made it smaller let's go ahead and critique <laughs> I can, we're allowed to be critical too yeah. I would say that Vermeer um, doesn't do hands particularly well mm. except for the lace maker which is great his feet are not always good mm. in his early paintings but um, and there are there are moments when he loses some control and you could even say in the green curtain it's hanging in a very odd way at the very bottom of the mm. painting. Um, mm. The fringe all comes exactly the same. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure that's quite how that would work. You, but I can forgive him that because so much of the rest of it is wonderful. Do you ever think that some of the female faces lack a degree of character? Yeah, not this one. This one, I definitely know what she's like. Mm. She's, she's studious and mm. she's, um, she's concerned, um, but there are others where I think, hmm, yeah, I think we could do with a little bit more character. Uh, having said that, my favorite painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring, is full of character, mm. but it's all cloaked in mystery, mm. too. Mm. And that, that's what I love about Vermeer is this, these interiors that are so mysterious. Mm. And I think I said this before, but there is a feeling that we are spying on this young woman reading yeah. the letter. We're not really supposed to be seeing her. And, um, and yet we are given this privilege, the curtain has been drawn back so that we can watch her doing something that's essentially very private. In terms of the storytelling, I mean, many of these paintings of the young women, their lives are being affected in that moment or more generally by the absence of, or the arrival of, or the presence of a male character. The ma I mean, he, he famously, many of his paintings 
I think somebody did a comparison with other Dutch artists, and he's way ahead in terms of his female to male ratio yeah. in his paintings. Is that something you, you kind of... I mean, I almost feel sad for these women. They're all reacting to the departure of the man or the man that's there that's trying to ply them with alcohol or this, this perhaps is a lover from overseas or, or my gain well, my... Welcome to the female world. <laughs> it, up until recently, you know, I, we, women were not allowed to um, go to higher education until the last couple of hundred years, 150 years, um, in, in England anyway, and uh, maybe earlier other places. So there were um, most middle class women, which is what this woman would have been, their whole life was expected to be about um, uh, marrying and creating a family, and that's just the way it was. I'm so used to that, but I don't know, almost don't think about it anymore. But um, unfortunately, that is the way, that was the way of the world then, and we're very lucky we have more possibilities now. But this young woman would not have uh, trained to be a, a teacher or a, or a doctor or a nurse or a musician. She would, have been, she would have been trained to become a housewife and a mother. And, and, and so often when there are windows in paintings, I'm thinking more, you know, late 19th century, say American Impressionists with women in the, in the frame, it's, it's suggesting the possibility of the outside world. Mm. This presumably isn't suggesting that at all. It's suggesting there's an outside world that she is here responding to via the letter. Is that your view? Yes. I mean, um, what makes this painting less oppressive is that the window's open. And um, yeah. she may be inside, but th to me, there's a feeling that she's not exactly trapped. Yeah. She's, uh, she can look out, she can poke her head out and get fresh air. And these, the implication to me being that she can go outside, but nonetheless, there are parameters. I mean, she is bounded by the window and the Cupid painting and the green curtain and the carpet on the table so there's a you could say you could say she's trapped but I, I would like to think that she's not entirely trapped she would have been less trapped if there was a white completely white wall behind her but yeah. never mind never mind I'll take it as it is now but it's beautiful just to be to look at you know I've seen this painting many times in reproduction but there's something about being with it mm. you start to notice the glimmers of light on her, on her dress, on the, on the fruit, on the letter, all of the on the on the curtain. It's all um, so vivid. I just love it. I mean, one of the things that I think is great when you're making a film about paintings like this is you go in for the close-ups, and they're staggering. I mean, that ruffled. I mean, what are, is it? A tablecloth underneath the fruit is that what it's, yes I mean, they used to use um carpet turkish carpets oh. or persian carpets sometimes um on tables it was a dutch thing so is that because they might have a brazier underneath because well, you know i don't know they might have had foot warmers but i think it was just the tradition hmm. i remember once being in a very cold house in spain in extremadura and we sat around having dinner but it was a very heavy dining room tape uh, um cover, mm -hmm. went right to the floor and underneath, under the table was a kind of a, a, a brazier of some sort, because nice. they had no heating in the house. Right, um, so that kept you toasty warm. Kept us toasty warm. I mean, the thing is, there are so many, you could take so many sections of this yeah. as beautiful still lives. I mean, the fruit alone. Um, the fruit, I mean, it's not quite Cezanne, but it's, it's yeah. pretty good. And also, you start, the longer you take to look at things, you start to notice the, the window frame is blue. Mm. And it really is very blue, and you don't notice it at first. And then that red curtain in contrast, it's, um, it's wonderful. And that's this exhibition, if people get to see it. There are only 28 paintings, which is not very many. Most exhibitions of artists have, you know, 100 paintings mm. at least. And this means that you can take your time mm. and really look at a painting and slow down. And the other thing about the exhibition is there's, there's interpretation, but not too much. It's not these little labels that you have to read yeah, all about. Yeah. And they've done it beautifully. Less is more. I've always yeah. believed that yeah. with Vermeer in my own life. And I think they've taken it um, and run with it here, and it works really well.
I've been to plenty of exhibitions. Actually, I remember Gauguin at the Tate, and it was wall to wall, and it was it's too much. You it's, can't. Yeah. Let, less is definitely more. Um, you are. You may be unique in having seen all. Do you, do you count? No, there the, are there are people who collect Vermeers. I read an article in the New York Times a few years ago about people who go and see all uh, of them, and okay. I thought, oh, I'm not unique. <laughs> well, there must be a nice collective noun, the Vermeerists, or well, something. Well, yes, yeah, something like that. And they were talking about it was Americans, a lot of Americans. And if you go to the states in normal times when there's not an exhibition, you can see five of them at uh, the Met, three at the Frick. So that's yeah. in New York. Yeah. And then if you take the train down to D.C., you can see three more. Yeah. So you can see 11 yeah, um, yeah. in one day if you yeah. want to. Um, so people love that. Yeah. They love that. I've been doing something similar with Caravaggio, but there's, there's more. There are more, <laughs> but not that many more. Yeah. That, not that many more. Um, I have a question. So if you've seen all, say, mm -hmm. 36, 37, in this exhibition there are 28 is there an argument, or is this, is this just an awful thought to the art world, of having the other, what, nine high-class reproductions, either oh. on the route or in a separate room, if you want to try and get a sense of his entire career? I mean, is that a ridiculous idea? Uh, you know, I have seen incredibly high-quality reproductions uh, the printing these days is amazing. I, I hadn't really thought of that. I suppose you could, but maybe they were hoping that last minute mm. there were people would change, some of the places would change their mind. A lot of places, I think the Queen owns one, and there's one at Kenwood, so there's two in mm. London, apart from the two that are here at the National Gallery. Um, and they both said they're too fragile to, to travel. And um, I guess I hadn't really thought of that. You should ask the curator yeah. whether whether they'd be willing to do that. I think they might feel the purity of having seeing the originals is you can't tamper that with yeah. the twenty first century reproduction. I know the Van Gogh Museum has been experimenting with three D reproductions of Van Gogh paintings because they get so many requests that they're thinking ahead that one day they might be able to send a three D high class reproduction for an exhibition rather than, because you know, they don't want to send the sunflowers right, to every right, exhibition. Right. One final question. Now I know famously, you had Girl with a Pearl Earring at the end of your bed. Yeah. And that's where the, the whole story began for your book, your novel. Would you now swap? Would you now have this one at the end of your bed or in your <laughs> living room instead of? No. You can't have them both. No, I would still keep Girl with the Pearl Earring because it's, it's um, become more than a painting. It's a, um, for me, it's become a part of my life. And uh, she's changed my writing life, and I, I owe it to her to keep her close. Okay. Uh, I, I think this would, this would be definitely up there for me if I had to choose one. But that's the problem with this exhibition is that actually those early religious paintings, I, I actually... I, I mean, Mary and Martha, I think, it's a, I think it's a fantastic painting, for example. I mean, there's so many. That's the mark yeah. of a great artist, isn't yeah. it? It is. And, and also the mark of a great artist is paintings that you come back to again and again with unanswered questions. I feel like I could look at this girl reading her letter and always be wondering what she's reading and thinking um, and what, what Vermeer makes of her and what we should make of her. And those, those will always turn over in my mind. The other thing I think, finally, is that it may be 350 years um, more, but the human emotion... I mean, I, I see my 23-year-old daughter in this painting. I mean, the human emotions are consistent, and again, that's a mark of a great artist, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, things that paintings that you come back to again and again and, and, and make connections with. So you see your daughter in it or you see your, your niece in it yeah. or you, you think of yourself when you're reading a letter um, yeah. that moved you in some way and you think, wow, did I look like that? It's just I didn't, nobody was there to capture it. Yeah. Tracy, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at 7th-art.com or contact us by emailing info at 7th-art.com
See you next time. <laughs>